It's great to be here. Uh, welcome everyone, which is welcome to Austin, Texas. Welcome to your own sofa, I guess. Um, I'll try to remember to speak relatively slowly. Okay. I'd like to talk about three things. Um, first of all, my mission or how I see my mission in philosophy. And I have to say, I have never seen my career as for teaching people objectivism. That's just not the way I approached it from the beginning or even now, really. Rather, there were issues I really wanted to understand better. You know, like I was burning about certain issues from the time I was an undergrad, and then I learned something about Ayn Rand's philosophy, but it was never, oh, go into philosophy so that you can proselytize for objectivism. It, my interest has always been, in a way, much more immediately selfish. There are things I want to figure out. I want to understand better to help me lead my life, to figure out how everybody should be leading their lives. And even today, I mean, as I choose subjects that I might want to give a lecture on, you know, at a big conference or write an article on or something, I'm thinking about what's interesting to me. That, I think, could be of real value to other people. Okay, I mean, that's definitely in the mix. I'm not just supposed to be amusing myself or talking to myself. But I guess I just want to acquaint you with the idea that you needn't go into a philosophy or another sort of academic intellectual career for the purpose of preaching objectivism. Okay, I certainly use objectivism. I try to use it um, in everything that I write and think. It informs my thinking tremendously. But objectivism as such has not really been my subject. Now, there are some exceptions. I mean, some of you know, obviously, I wrote a book that's on Ayn Rand's theory of the virtues, okay? And I have occasionally taught a course at my university on objectivism, but occasionally, for the most part, I wanted to understand something better. Rights, values, certain issues in the value of sports, right? Um, judicial interpretation, theories of judicial review. So my own interest has been pretty personally, selfishly grounded, but again, I'm looking for issues that I think could be a real help to other people to understand better. Okay. The second thing I want to talk about, and I have a lot more to say on this, is essentially, I love my job. I love what I do. I am having so much fun. It isn't even funny. I'm having a great time, and I really want to expand on that. So literally... I enjoy the activities of an academic intellectual life very much. I like the writing end. I like the teaching end. They're rewarding in different ways. Uh, I mean, those two, if you go into an academic position, are often distinguished. You know, well, do you like the research or do you like the teaching? Um, they're rewarding in different ways. They tap different kinds of skills. And I really deeply enjoy them both. So let me first talk a little bit about the writing research end of things. Writing is just the end of doing a lot of thinking. You know, some of the speakers already today have talked about how you have to be persevering and so on. You really have to want to try to figure things out because when we're talking philosophy, it can take a while to figure things out, right? So before I'm ready to write on something, there are just those early stages of ideas are popping, you know, and you've got enough ideas in a certain area that you think, you know, there might be an article in that or there might be a, a point, a new thesis to make about that. And I love those early stages where you're just gathering, oh my gosh, and this connects with that and you're popping out the post-it notes constantly because you're seeing integrations all over the place, and that's very exciting. And then I also like the stage at which you're, okay, if I had to give a lecture next week, how would I organize it? Just what would the rough sub-subjects be? And so on. And then you start, you know, really thinking those through. Well, is this part really just a part of this other? Is that really different? What's the logical connection here? I like that process of trying to x-ray the logical spine of a project, of an idea. Um, then the outlining, more careful. I won't go on too long about this, but there are a lot of different phases to a writing project. It depends a little bit if it's an article, a book, or what range of article it is. But, uh, you know, there's the editing, the refining, the trying to get it just right, and so on. I That is all a lot of fun for me, okay? I mean, Think of me what you will, but I enjoy those activities. 
When you're writing philosophy, though, the gratification is a long-term proposition because it, it's, you know, I'm only writing on ideas that are sufficiently hard to interest me. They're not all equally hard by any stretch, but they're not the kinds of things I can figure out in, you know, a weekend. So my point is the gratification is usually slow and incremental and in nice contrast to that. Now here's the teaching. Oh, you have much more limited ambitions, you know, on a week to week, class to class basis. You're trying to do something much more manageable. You're getting much quicker feedback from the students as to whether or not you succeeded in a given class. So there's a kind of gratification that's a nice complement to the longer term, gradual, big picture kind of gratification that you have to absorb while you're working on a really involved research project. Um, again, part of what I want to do is simply concretize the activities so that any of you who are contemplating academic intellectual careers can have some of the reality in mind, right? I mean, teaching, I really enjoy teaching. I really enjoy students. It's wonderful when it goes well. It's wonderful when it doesn't go well. Grading papers is not the most fun in the world. And sometimes you're grading papers that aren't that good and that's kind of discouraging. So that, that, that was part of this past week for me, right? You're planning courses. Now that's often a lot of fun in the big picture, especially if it's an idea for a new course that you've come up with, that's great. But then, you, you know, there are hard decisions in breaking down exactly who will we read and how much will we spend on how much time on this guy or that guy. There's making exams as well. So there's, a, I mean, you just have to think about uh, what would you be doing at eight o'clock on Tuesday morning and at 11 o'clock on Tuesday morning and all through that. But there's another dimension that I want to bring up that I think we often overlook in an intellectual career, whether you're writing or teaching, you're trying to communicate with an audience. And I think it's really important to pay attention to that communication aspect of things. Now here again, what's fortunate for me is I enjoy that, but I really enjoy thinking about how is this going to go over? I don't mean, are they going to like it or not, but how are they going to hear what I'm saying in a lecture? And what can I do to make it clearer to them, to this audience? You've got to be very specific about the kinds of people you're talking about, what they know, what they're interested in, what you can and can't take for granted. And I think sometimes people attracted to intellectual careers think, as long as I've mastered the material, enough said. Not at all. Um, there are many people who master material, but just don't give enough time to being objective in the way they communicate. And it's going to be somewhat different if you're communicating on paper, if you're communicating on Zoom, if you're communicating in a room of five people or a hundred people. Uh, you've really got to think through some of the communication dynamics, I think, to do the communicating effectively. But here again, like, I think that's kind of fun. I like thinking about those issues. So, Again, just trying to give you the picture. Um, one, one other, there's a free piece of advice I'll throw in on that score. I don't know about you, but I found this is true. You cannot be too clear. You cannot be too clear. Nobody ever said that was too clear. They might say, oh, that was repetitious or something like that, but you cannot be too clear. And you need to keep that in mind, I think, in order to try to make what you are putting on the page or in the lecture as intelligible, as readily, of course, at least I understand what she's saying, you know, as readily intelligible as you can. So that's, okay, free advice. Uh, let me go on a little bit more about other things I really like in what I do. Uh, I like people, you know, I like people. I like trying to communicate with people, um, especially people who are interested in ideas who are going to be up at midnight, wherever, whatever part of the globe you're in right now, listening to these ideas, people who are in school. I enjoy learning from people, all sorts of people. You do learn, the cliche is true, you can learn a lot from your students. They sometimes will raise aspects of issues that, duh, you just hadn't thought about that are really valid parts of issues that need to be thought about. Um, you can certainly learn from colleagues. You can learn from non-objectivists, you know, in discussion groups and so on. I could, I could go on at great length about that. But turning people on to good ideas, to better ideas, just 
you know, even if you're studying philosophy of law and you're not studying Ayn Rand per se, if you can put them on a better track about how to think about intellectual property, for instance, which is Adam Masoff's specialty, right? That's a very good thing. And that's a nice thing to be able to do, an enjoyable thing. Um, another thing I like about this career, it fosters lifelong learning. I keep coming up with things that I want to understand better. I mean, I'm going to run out of time long before I'm going to hit everything on the list. There are just new issues I'd like to understand better, areas that I haven't yet applied the philosophy to. There are things, you know, that I thought I knew or I, I, I basically know, but you still uncover new aspects that you had missed previously. And in this career, I get paid. I get paid to do this. This is a good deal, okay? This is a very good deal. Let me say a couple more things about what I enjoy about this. Um, the environment of a college campus is a nice place to be. This was not something I thought about in advance by any stretch. And it's only kind of gradually dawned on me explicitly in the past few years. But, you know, compared to the world around and what you're reading in the daily news, College campuses tend to be focused on youth, on the future, possibility. There's a lot of idealism. I think you have a much greater proportion of people on a college campus who still think life is great than you do in certain other pockets of the culture. And that's just a really nice, upbeat environment to be in and to be a part of. You have a lot of young people. And again, this is going to vary depending on the kind of school you're at if you're teaching at a university or college. But the general tenor is upbeat in a, in a really, I think, healthy, positive way. So that's nice. Uh, a last thing on what I enjoy about the career. I have been able to enjoy a lot of freedom in what I do. Now, this will vary a great deal depending on if you get a job, the kind of school you're at, what your teaching load is. Are you teaching two courses, three courses each semester, four? Do you have much choice of what you're teaching? So this really will vary a great deal, even among some of the panelists today. Our experiences um, will have differed in this regard. But even when you're under a fair number of constraints, well, you've got to teach the logic every semester or the intro to ethics, you often have a lot of freedom in how you teach things and you often have a lot of freedom in what you assign and so on. You can come up with ideas for new courses. Your research is largely driven by what interests you. So it, there are a lot of respects in which you can be your own boss. And I like that. I like that autonomy very much. Now, I do want to say my third topic. Uh, it's hard work. It's hard work. Again, I like doing it, but it is hard work. First, the profession of philosophy. And again, you'll be hearing from people who, like Brad Thompson, he's not in a philosophy department, okay? But, and I don't mean that these other fields aren't hard, each in its own way. Uh, but as a profession from 40 years ago, 30 years ago, we knew the job market for any philosophy student was terrible. This had nothing to do with being an objectivist, but very few people get jobs. There aren't a lot of um, faculty positions for philosophy PhDs. Publication to be published in the best journals, it's something like a 5% acceptance rate, less than that in some cases. You're going to get a lot of rejection, and that's just the nature of the profession. So you have to have thick skin. You have to have uh, self-esteem, okay, um, to get through that, you have to have the conviction that, no, this is what I have to be doing. I have to be doing this, okay? And we can talk about that more in questions if you like. Then, of course, there is the chilly reception of Ayn Rand, right? I mean, Ayn Rand, as Ankar was saying, uh, you know, radically changed, uh, radically challenges people's ideas, people's ideas, and that does not always go over very well, to say the least. It's a lot better than it used to be, but you know, there's a certain hostility to objectivism. But the main thing I want to say about the way in which philosophy is hard is it's philosophy. You know, we're not making crumb cake here. We are talking about very abstract ideas. We're talking about volition and force and the mind and causality and induction. And even when you're applying philosophical ideas, how does objectivity apply to how judges should interpret the law? 
these are not no brainers. They're all brainers. And I, I find a lot of the work really difficult, challenging. And I think one of the challenges is to find projects that are the right level of challenge for you such that they're doable, but you're growing and you're learning new things as you do them. Um, but philosophical work is hard. The world is so bloody integrated that everything is connected with everything else. And part of your role is to figure out what I can intelligently say on just this piece of an issue, uh, you know, that gives enough of the context and enough support without turning it into a piece on something other than what, you know, I just want to say this about free speech, but I have to say this about freedom. What do I have to imply about egoism? Should I go into that here, etc.? There are a lot of hard decisions you have to make. Um, I don't want to take too much time, so let me speed up without speeding up a little bit here. Many is the day, you know, that I emerge from this desk and just feeling like, well, I barely moved the ball forward on this project today because the issues are really difficult. Um, again, I like untangling them, but it takes patience. And I do want to be realistic with you about it's being hard and it's being slow going and incremental. Now, again, it's going to depend on different people and what projects you undertake, but so at any rate, I want it to be realistic, but let me end with this. The reality is I love what I do. I'm having such fun. I'm so thankful that I get to do it. Um, you can have a very happy career, I think, as an academic. Given the event today and some of the thrust of ARI, there's a part of me that feels like, so I should be rah-rah and really try to inspire you to go into this career. But I only want to inspire you if you should be inspired, right? If this is right for you and it's not right for everybody, okay? So in a way, I want to point back to my first point, which was about my mission, how I've seen what I'm doing. Because I think if you are at all contemplating a career, whether as an academic or in some other intellectual role or using the philosophy, you really want to be thinking about what's your mission? What's going to make you happy? What are you going to enjoy doing? What do you love doing? That's what you want to be thinking about as you, you know, assess everything that you're hearing today and just thinking more broadly. So again, thanks. I hope I didn't go too quickly and I'll talk to you all in a, in a little bit.